Okay, so this is the first video in the Unit 3 module. Here we are going to be moving away from the basis of the atom and really getting into how those atoms bond and form compounds. Oops, there you go. So for this unit, we're going to be looking at differentiating between ionic and covalent compounds. Specifically, we're also going to look at acids and bases. And then we're going to look at what types of compounds we're going to deal with for the rest of the semester, as well as their properties. Now, unfortunately, what that means is we have several things that we need to do. We're going to write formulas when we're given the name. We're going to name compounds when we're given the formulas and that can be kind of intense and so we're going to take it step by step here as we uh, talk about the different types. Now this is the outline for this unit. Um, for right now I just want to focus on the periodic table. Technically we Whoa. did discuss this in the last unit. Oh for goodness sake. Um, but here we're going to revisit a couple of the trends that are really important for this unit as well. So here's our periodic table. This is not the one you get on your exam, but it is a good one. Remember that we have mostly metals. All of these blue things are metals. Uh, we have some non-metals over here and then a couple of metalloids. Now, as we look at the periodic table, we have groups or families. These are the columns. They are going to have similar properties. They're going to be properties that are related to one another but vary only in like how intense they are. Um, if they're reactive maybe they react just a little bit quicker. Uh, then we also have our periods. Periods are these horizontal rows. And these vary, the properties vary in these rows. In the same way things can change over time. There we go. Um, here we go. Now, we did talk about this before. I know that you've seen it, but I'm really, I just want to make sure you're with me here. As we look at the periodic table, remember, we've got these specific columns that have properties that we care about. Now, for the most part, when we look at um, things like uh, the alkali metals right here. They are going to be highly reactive and because we know their Lewis structure from the last unit we know that these are typically going to form charges of a positive one. The alkaline earth metals on the other hand are also reactive. They have two valence electrons. They only have to lose two to become like the noble gases and so they're going to end up forming charges of plus two. This one is plus three. Row four, we don't really worry about. Um, carbon doesn't go plus or minus anything. And then the transition metals down here are different. So then nitrogen, phosphorus, those will form charges of minus three because they only need to gain one, two, three electrons to be like a noble gas. Oxygen, this column is going to be minus two, minus one, and again, no charge. And so it's plus one, plus two, plus three, skip one, three minus, two minus, one minus. Um, also for consistency's sake, we always write the number and then the charge. Um, it's not going to be addition or subtraction here, it is a charge, so you do number then sign. Now as we are working on this guys, it's a really good idea to go ahead and memorize these rows which uh, groups which you've already done but remember that um, everything over here is a metal. Hydrogen is not included in that. Uh, it's not really a metal but anyway. So alkali metals are group one. They form an ion with a plus one charge. Highly reactive here. Alkaline earth metals still pretty reactive. They're found in a lot in the earth's crust. Here's this two plus charge. Um, transition metals have variable charges and um, they're just really neat overall. They're used for so many cool things. Um, 
Halogens are the most reactive nonmetals. They tend to be always diatomic. Uh, they're going to have an ion with a negative one charge. They're going to be your anion, or one of your anions. And then you have noble gases, which are non-reactive because they have their full octet. So remember, guys, this is the periodic table that you get on your exam. I'm not me making you memorize where things are. I'm not making you memorize atomic mass or anything crazy. Um, but this is what you have for your exam. And so you can kind of go ahead and write on here if you want, the, as soon as you get it, plus uh, charge of plus 1, 2 plus, 3 plus, skip 1, 3 minus, 2, oops, 2 minus, 1 minus. And that's going to kind of give you a... a instantaneous reminder. All of these are variables so we will deal with those in a little bit. Okay so let's go back to some of those trends. Now remember we talked before about valence electrons but I'm going to do it again here. So if we looked at group one, remember this ends in something S1. So like this would be it's ns1 is how it's usually done. 1s1, this ends in 1s2, 2s1, 3s1, and so it's really related. They all have uh, one valence electrons. electron. So if we do something like, I'm going to look at this row. If we do sodium, sodium is in group 1, it has one valence electron. So you can draw it like that, just a dot indicating that electron. You can also do it down here. I mean, it doesn't really matter. The point is you have an electron on there somewhere. Oops. Magnesium is in group 2. This ends in NS2. So it's got its two valence electrons. It's in the S block, two electrons. If you can't remember that, it's group 2, so two valence electrons. Now, remember Hund's rule said you don't pair them until you absolutely have to. So it should be one on one side, one on another. Now if you want, you can go on opposite sides. It really doesn't matter. I typically am um, a little OCD, so I go uh, clockwise. I don't know why. Um, but yeah. So group three, you can kind of already imagine, is going to have three valence electrons. I was supposed to do aluminum, right? We're doing, yeah, this row. Same thing, as long as we don't have them paired, they can be written any way. Uh, yeah, that's good enough. Um, at that point, now we are to silicon. And that is in group four, so it's got four valence electrons. So we're going to have one on each side. Not really much uh, difference in how we write that. Phosphorus is in group five. One, two, three, four. Now we have an electron on each side, so now we can start to pair it. There we go. Then we have sulfur is in group six. One, two, three, four. And again, it really doesn't matter where you pit the others as long as, you know, two sides have two. Kind of like that. It doesn't really matter. Um, chlorine has got seven because it's in group seven two, three, and then argon is in group eight, so it's going to have eight, just like that. Now this is kind of going to lead us into those charges as we get to ionic compounds in a few minutes, but it does help make sense. You know, sodium wants to look like argon, all it has to do is lose this one electron, you lose a negative, you get a positive charge. Magnesium has to lose two, so it loses two negatives, so it ends up with a positive two charge. Same thing here with aluminum, you can lose three, you get a three plus charge. Um, silicon group four is really strange. We don't really deal with charges there, um, and you won't until much, much later in life, um, if ever. Uh, phosphorus is only three short, so it's going to try and gain electrons here, here, and here. Um, you gain three negatives, you get a three minus charge. Sulfur is losing, it needs two, so it's going to gain two, form a two minus charge. Need one here, one minus, and then same thing with group eight, there's no charge. And so there's kind of a correlation between these charges that we wrote up here 
and the number of valence electrons that we have from the last unit. And so as we move into this unit, I just want you to see that relationship and why we care. Now we can also relate it to electronegativity and ionization energy. Electronegativity is just a measure of how well an electron can attract, I'm sorry, how well an atom can attract an electron. Now, really, all atoms have protons in their nucleus, so they do have some attraction for random electrons, but this is a measure of how well. I mean, I can want a million dollars. It doesn't mean I can, you know, attract a million dollars to fall on my lap. You know, it, it's a matter of just because it can have it or want it doesn't mean that it's able to attract it. And so the idea here is that as we deal with bonds in a couple minutes, um, you want to evaluate within the bond who wants the electrons more. And generally, electronegativity increases to the right of the periodic table and up, with fluorine being the highest. And I mean, if you look at, let me go, come on. If you look at the periodic table, this guy has got nine, fluorine has nine electrons. He's so close to 10. He really wants it. Um, I mean, imagine you had $9. You need 10 to get lunch. You're going to really fight for it. Meanwhile, down here, something like iodine, you know, he still would really like some um, electrons. But you have 53 bucks. You only need 54. You can kind of, you, you can make, you can make do, right? I mean, so what? It's just a dollar. But up here, this is a huge difference for fluorine. And so fluorine wants electrons more than anyone else. On the other hand, if electronegativity increases up and to the right, on the bottom left, it's got very low electronegativity. And that makes sense because the, the metals and the things over here want to lose electrons. They don't want to gain electrons. They don't want to pull electrons to it. They want to get rid of their valence electron and be like a noble gas. Okay, And so as we go into ionic bonds, that play on electronegativity is a huge factor here. So once again, electronegativity increases this way and up with fluorine being the highest. Hopefully that will kind of help you see where we're going with our bonds. Um, that's really it as a review for the periodic table. There it is.